Good morning, CIBC. Um, it's, it's such a joy to be gathered here to lift up the name of our Lord and also, you know, very, very, uh, such a blessing to be, be uh, able to witness and hear the beautiful music from, from Nathan. And so we're grateful for his uh, uh, talent and his uh, willingness to play some, some opening songs for us as we're uh, uh, reminded uh, from the, those hymns that uh, we indeed should be here to focus our hearts and our minds on, on lifting up the name of the Lord whose majesty is declared across the heavens and the earth. All right, and so this morning, let's join our voices in praising our faithful and awesome God as we sing uh, together his, his great praises, his he is so worthy. And so let's stand together um, as we prepare uh, to worship our God this morning.
God's will for us than anything we may turn to here on earth. And we are so privileged to have a relationship with him by the grace of Christ alone. And so this morning, all these songs, these words that we've sung, let this be our prayer, our desire that we would be drawn evermore to him in our lives, in our thoughts, in our hearts, in our time, in our efforts that we spend. So we'll sing this last time together um, in Christ. Christ alone, my hope is found. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter.
Well, today our, uh, our topic is an interesting one, that is for sure. Um, as part of our series called Informed and Transformed, we're going to be talking about social media today. And uh, I, had to, I had to definitely uh, remind myself to, uh, to, to apply what I'm about to preach to my own life. Um, as I mentioned before, this is a part of our series entitled Informed and Transformed, and it really is based on Romans 12, verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And this came about uh, simply because, uh, as I mentioned before in previous uh, sessions, as uh, Pastor Theron and I were, were thinking about this, this next series, we were both burdened by what we see happening in the church and in our world, of how there is so much influence outside of Scripture and outside of God that is shaping and molding uh, the minds and the lives of people around us, including people in the church, including believers. And so we wanted to use this uh, these few weeks that we've had uh, to touch on some issues, some of these sources that we see coming in and having an undue influence, undue molding, undue conforming effect on, uh, on the, the hearts and the minds of, of people. And uh, today, I, I, get the, I get the fun one. I get to talk about social media. Uh, but before we get there, just to kind of touch on what what, what, what may be at the heart of, uh, of why we're even talking about this, I want to ask you a question. Okay, so uh, we'll go like this. So raise, raise your hands. This is audience participation time. Uh, how many of you think that the older people, let's say 60 and up, they are the most susceptible to scams? How many of you think that? It's the older generation that are the most susceptible to scams. Oh, okay, I'm actually... I was like, it's probably all the young people are going to raise their hands, right? No, actually, uh, some of our, our older uh, brothers and sisters, they raise their hands too. Okay, how many of you think it's the younger generation? Oh, wow, much less. Well, if you were, if you were uh, into betting, which I hope you're not, uh, most of you would lose because uh, as research has consistently shown, it is actually young people that are the most susceptible to online scams. Believe it or not, uh, by a rate of, of sometimes twice as much, uh, 20 to 29-year-olds have reported that 44% of them, 44% of 20 to 29-year-olds have fallen and lost money to some sort of a scam, as opposed to 20% among the 70 and 79-year-olds. So give yourselves a hand, our, our seniors. You guys are doing much better than you think and than the world thinks. But before you pat yourself on the back too much, the difference is when the older generation gets scammed, they lose a lot more money. So uh, on average, they say the younger generation, when they get scammed, they lose about maybe 500. Uh, but for the older generation, it's often over 1,000. So um, we see that uh, both, it, it, regardless of age, people are susceptible to scams. And what's revealed is that scammers are very smart. They know exactly how to target uh, different demographics, different age groups. For the young, the types of scam that uh, the 20 to 40 year olds usually fall for are work at home scams or online shopping scams, scams that offer easy money or, very importantly, scams that offer to pay off your debt or consolidate debt. For the 40 to 60 year olds, uh, I guess I would actually be among that group. Uh, the biggest scams that uh, my age group falls for is uh, tech support scams and dating and romance scams. Make of that what you will. For these 60 and up, the most uh, typical scams are imposter fraud, where someone pretends to be a, uh, a government agency or a relative asking you for personal information or the good old sweepstakes lottery scams. And those have been around <laughs> forever in the days of, uh, of mail. So what can we learn from this? What can we learn from this is that no age is safe 
from scams. And at the heart of this is everyone can fall victim to false information in some way. It's just that we have different areas where we're weak. And perhaps most alarming and what should cause us to take note is that our own beliefs about our ability to detect falsehood and our own beliefs about our wisdom is very often overrated. And this is where it starts relating to social media. Because uh, as I'm talking about these scams, a lot of these take place through social media. And social media has increasingly become uh, the place where we share information and we get information. And we, we, of course, all of us, however much we may use social media or not, we recognize it has a huge impact on our lives. And because no one is safe and we are all susceptible, what I'm trying to say here is this message is for you, okay? No matter how much or how little you use social media, how how uh, good you are at using it, you may think you are, no one is immune and everyone is susceptible. So all that to say, please pay attention, okay? Because there will be something here for every age group. This is not a message for the young or the old, it's a message for the church. So before we jump in, we have to do a quick bit of definition. What is social media? Right? It's one of those things where we all know at some level what it is, but it may be hard to define. I found this definition to be pretty helpful, and I realize now it's very tiny. <laughs> so I'll, I'll just read it for us. Um, it, social media is basically just the computer-based technology that facilitates the sharing of ideas, thoughts, and information through virtual networks and communities. That is a mouthful to just focus on three key words. Uh, number one is sharing, right? Sharing of information. Number two is virtual. This does not take place face to face. And number three, it involves communities of some sort, large groups of people, right? Pretty simple concept. It's a, it's a way to allow large groups of people to share lots of information in a virtual way without having to gather together and be face to face, right? We understand that. And the biggest players are uh, some of the biggest companies and biggest brands in the world. Now, show of hands, how many of you guys recognize every single icon up there? Oh, not as much as I thought. How many recognize everything but one of them? Okay, okay. Well, okay, so maybe you guys are not as social media savvy as I thought. I gave you guys too much credit. No, no, I, I had trouble with some of them. I'm like, wait, what's the little ghost one? No. <laughs> Uh, well, that one is Snapchat, by the way, which apparently my picture's out of date because nobody uses Snapchat anymore, right? Um, so we know who the big players are, and chances are you, at, uh, most of you, I would say, use at least one of these, right? Uh, maybe a better question to ask, how many of you use, let's say, five of these services? How many of you have accounts with five of these services? Five or more, okay? How many of you use four? Three, only three, okay. Two, oh, okay, okay. And how many of you only use one? How many of you use none? <laughs> Raise your hands proudly. <laughs> All right, okay. Okay, uh, I don't know if that's true for some of you. <laughs> All right, so uh, it impacts most of our lives, right? Uh, but here's where it gets a little more serious. You know, those three keywords I, I mentioned, sharing, virtual, communities, they sound innocuous enough, but when you combine the three together, very powerful and unpredictable things start happening. Uh, entire business empires have risen and fallen through social media. People have made their fortune and made careers and lost them through social media. Social media has infiltrated every single part of our lives from how we decide what to eat, what to wear, how to pay for things, how we form opinions about things, how we do research. It has touched every single part of our lives. And along with these powerful things that happen, there are many new dangers and challenges that have come from social media. There are brand new terms that have been invented in the age of social media. How many of you guys have heard of FOMO? Okay, how many of you guys suffer from FOMO? <laughs> 
probably most of us. FOMO stands for fear of missing out. And it is one of the primary um, side effects of social media use. You fear, you fear you're missing out on things when you look at what's going on in so many other people's lives. You feel like my life is not going anywhere. I'm not doing the things I wanna do or eating the things I wanna eat. The whole topic of cyberbullying uh, really came into the forefront because of social media. As I mentioned before, online scams, uh, miscommunication, uh, disinformation, mistrust, division, and then we get into the effects that social media has on mental health, on relationships. And uh, I jumped the gun a little bit, but um, you see some of the statistics that have happened since the advent of social media is actually quite alarming. Between 2005 and 2017, there's a 52% increase in depression amongst adolescents. Amongst young adults, that number jumps up to 63%, between 18 and 25, increase. There's a 47% increase in suicidal thoughts in young adults. And I can tell you this is absolutely true. One of the things that uh, I hear from our sponsors uh, as I'm talking to students is uh, just all the things that they're dealing with. There's a lot more talk of depression and thoughts of suicide and, and self-harm. And this translates into the rate of actual suicide, especially amongst high school girls. There's been a 65% increase in suicide in high school girls between 2010 and 2015. Now, a few things you must notice about these dates I've put up there. Number one, they don't even include the pandemic years. And number two, you notice these numbers start between 20. Uh, 2005 and 2010, what happened in that time? The smartphone was not invented, but popularized in that time. Since the start of the smartphone and kind of the rise of social media, this is one of the biggest effects that it's had on, well, not just young people, but people across the board. Today, we're gonna to be going through a lot of scripture, but I was trying to, as I was trying to settle on one particular passage that can sum up what we wanna talk about, my thoughts actually turn to James chapter three. James chapter three. So if you have your Bibles, I can, uh, you can turn there or you can follow along on the screen. Now, some of you may be familiar, James chapter three, verses five to eight, is talking about the power of the tongue. It's talking about the power of our words that we are able to speak and the effects, mostly for evil, in this passage that's highlighted, that our words can have. Now, as I read and you follow along, just substitute the word tongue for social media or smartphones. And I think that can give us an idea of just what we are dealing with when we hold that device in our hands. So let me read that for us, James 3, verses 5 through 8. So also the tongue is a small member. Yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a, a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, uh, straining the whole body, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. All right, if we substitute the word smartphone or substitute the word social media in there, I think we get an idea of just the impact that it has. And I don't think that that connection is, a, is just something I made up because what is social media but an extension of the power of the tongue? the extension of our ability to speak words, but now at a greater range and with greater effect than ever before. So as we consider this issue of social media, I hope you see how important it really is. And the question for us today is, well, you know, the way James talks about the tongue, the difference is, right, all of us know that the tongue can be used for good. In, in fact, great good. This is just a warning that this power that we have in our words can be used for great evil. 
And of course, this is not something we can do away with. All of us need to use our words. We need to communicate in some way. That's not true necessarily of social media, right? We can turn it off, unplug, and like the few people who raise their hands, not use it at all. So the question for us today is, well, is there any good that come from social media? And if so, how can we use that for good? How can we use social media in a way that can honor God? And so uh, I just want to highlight for us three broad principles we can apply so that if and when we do use social media, we can use it in a way that honors God. So this first principle is this, is you need to build on the benefits of social media. Build on the benefits of social media. I'm going to start with the good news, right, that there is a lot of good that can come from social media use, but we got to make sure we're using it for the right things. Well, number one, or letter A, uh, social media is a window to the world. It's a window to the world. Some of the strengths of social media is the way that it can very quickly burst the little bubble that you build around yourself, if you're willing. It allows you to communicate with people outside of your geographical, political, and religious world, very often in negative ways, but very often you can be exposed to different viewpoints. It expands uh, your your view and introduces a wide range of new ideas and experiences. Social media is very good at that, perhaps too good. Right? How many times have you gone online to look for something like, I, I need to focus on this thing, and then all of a sudden, something pops up and catches your eye, and then you're like, I, all of a sudden, I'm reading about you know, this, what's going on in another country, or what's going on over here and there. Right? It's very good at introducing you to new ideas. It's also very good at showing you a sign of the times. It shows you what people in our world are interested in. And that is actually very important for Christians to know. Not that we want to get into the same things, but we need to know where what people are, what's consuming people's minds. What are they talking about? Who's talking about it? Who are people listening to? It's a good way to get information. Right? And information is good for those who want to grow in knowledge and in intelligence. Right? Proverbs 18.15 says, An intelligent heart acquires knowledge, and the ear of the wise seeks knowledge. And we know that when it talks about knowledge in the Bible, it primarily speaks of knowledge of God. But we also know that being having an understanding of the world is not a bad thing. But we have to realize that this is a window. It's a window that shows everything that out, that's out there. It doesn't necessarily tell us what is right or true. It gives us information. It doesn't give us morality, and it doesn't draw good conclusions. So while it's a window to your world, make sure that it's a window and it doesn't become a door, that it's not your way to enter into things that you ought not to, and you don't open it so wide that things come into your life that you ought not to. Keep it as a window to the world. Another strength of social media is that it can sharpen your skills. Uh, maybe I'm speaking mostly to the husbands here. How many of you have found that you, uh, your abilities as a handyman around the house has been aided by YouTube? Let's be honest, right? Yeah, yeah, I know. I was, I was speaking to Hebron. I'm always amazed at all the different projects they do. And I'm like, how did you do that? He's always like, YouTube, <laughs> right? And, and if you've seen their backyard, it's, it's pretty amazing <laughs> what you can do. Uh, you know, with the ease of information, it's so easy for us to improve in certain things, uh, like cooking or baking or just things around the house, and even things for ministry, right? Uh, uh, social media is a wonderful tool. Uh, especially in these pandemic times, to continue growing and learning and being equipped for ministry. It increases our competency, and it allows us to quickly find those who share our interests and, have, and are like-minded, and that can be a dangerous thing. We'll talk about that later, but that can also be a good thing. 
Right? And it is good to be skilled and to use tools for us to get skills. Uh, Proverbs twenty two twenty nine. Do you see a man skilled in his work? He will stand before kings. He will not stand before obscure men. Uh, being knowledgeable and being skilled are good things. They can, they're to be prized. But again, the danger with social media, it's hard to know what's right. Uh, if you're looking, especially if you're trying to do electrical work on your house, uh, maybe don't turn to YouTube first, okay? Uh, there's a lot of uh, crazy stuff out there. And lastly, social media allow us to quickly communicate, quickly communicate. I cheated a little bit. I couldn't think of a C word that goes before communicates, so I, I did a C sound. So it quickly communicates, and, and you guys all understand that. We are so grateful for Zoom. You know, I can tell you personally, one of the best things to come out of the pandemic is the fact that we no longer, the leadership, the, the pastors and deacons, we don't have to attend our monthly full board meetings in person anymore. I cannot tell you how amazing that is. Like, we can actually do it over Zoom. We don't have to drive out to church, uh, you know, at 7.30 on a Thursday night and stay until, I won't say how long, but <laughs> uh, am I getting a little too excited? I have a little too much personal vested interest in this. But I'm sure you guys have all seen uh, that this is true. It allows us to quickly communicate, and it allows us, uh, especially, you know, uh, churches and ministries to get our message out in a way that we've never been able to before. Used rightly, social media can be a very powerful tool in proclaiming God's truth. Right? Psalm 96.3 reminds us that we are to declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous work among all the people, and Use rightly, social media can be a great tool for that. Now, there may be many more benefits, but I want to highlight these three strengths. And the reason I highlight this is uh, in, in that example I mentioned before, right? It's so easy to miss the reason why we got onto social media in the first place when we start using it. It's so easy to be distracted and go off into tangents, and before you know it, you're like, I spent an hour, <laughs> and I didn't look up the things I needed to look up. Remember what you're using social media for. And are you, and a good way to, to figure that out, are you using social media? Is your primary use of social media in line with one of these strengths? It's a good way to kind of gauge the effect that it's had on you. So that's the good news. And now we need to get a little more uh, serious, we need to start thinking a little more critically because the second aspect of this is we need to avoid the failures of social media. In other words, we have to be very aware of the weaknesses inherent in social media. We have to be aware of there's certain things that it's really not meant to do, so don't use it for that. And the first one is this. Social media is very bad at concluding conflicts. It is ba very bad at resolving issues and resolving conflicts. It's very good at starting conflicts, but it's very bad at ending them. And you can get, a, get an idea of why this is uh, when we look at Proverbs 15, 18. Right? It talks about a hot-tempered person stirs up conflict, but the one who is patient calms a quarrel, right? Those key words there uh, uh, kind of gets to the heart of how do you resolve a conflict well? Well, you need to be patient and you need to be calm, and those are generally not qualities associated with social media, right? It's like if you uh, were to start a YouTube channel and you're just patient and calm, you will get no views, right? Social media is built on very much the opposite, and those three qualities that I talked about before that are the hallmarks of social media, sharing, virtual, community, they don't lend themselves well to resolving conflicts because it's virtual, there is anonymity, there is no personal contact, so people tend to be much ruder, much crasser than they would in person. Because it's made to share, there is, at, at, at the same time, there is very weird censorship that goes on in social media right, the whole cancel culture, you say a certain phrase or you come across a certain way and you're done. And on the other hand, there is complete unregulation of what goes on out there, right? It's, it's this 
the worst of both worlds, really, when it comes to sharing. And as I mentioned before, it is quick, right? One of the, the hallmarks of social media is that it is so quick to do things, quick to respond, quick to find out. And that quickness is very bad uh, at building patience and taking the time to think through things. And this quickness, it may be quick, but it is not interactive. Right? Typically, you post something and then someone posts a response, right? So it's, it's just going back and forth and there is no actual real interpersonal connection. It's not good at resolving conflicts or coming up with conclusions. That leads us to the second failure of social media. It is bad at careful communication. It is bad at careful communication. That means if you want to actually think through and talk about a complicated issue, for example, politics, <laughs> social media may not be the best place, but now it's become the primary place. Right? Think about all the things, uh, all the battles going on in social media, sexuality, gender, uh, government, world affairs. These are complicated issues, and social media is probably the worst way to engage in actual thoughtful communication about it. At the heart of it, one of the, the, the lies that social media uh, can, can tell you is that uh, it is a good place for understanding and wisdom. It is not. Social media is a good place to get information and to kind of see what's out there. It is not actually a good place to get understanding and wisdom. It's a great place at collecting information, at presenting different viewpoints just to show you what's out there, but it doesn't lead you to the truth. And especially for students, I want to caution you against thinking that you can get to know a topic simply by going on social media or going on YouTube. You know, this is essentially, it's, it's just cliff notes versus reading the book and thinking about it and writing an essay about it. And this is especially dangerous for students because you, this is all you know. You grew up with this stuff. Uh, it, it's probably hard for many students to actually sit down and read through a book and think deeply about it. Not all, but, but many. It's so easy to just jump online, get a quick summary, and think you got it all. all right, James 1.19 tells us what thoughtful communication ought to be. Right. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. And again, the opposite of social media. In fact, there's a whole, uh, whole genre of YouTube videos called reaction videos, where you just watch people react to other people's videos, and they get millions of views, and you're just like, wow, they look so surprised. It's like, I don't get it. <laughs> Right? It's all about reaction, immediate reaction. We want to see that, that, that surprise or that anger. It values that. It's the opposite of James 1.19. If you were to characterize most online interactions, it would be the equivalent of pulling off virtual drive-bys. Right? You're in your little car, and you see someone you don't like, so you fire off you know, a bunch of bullets. Right? Ah, you Republican, I don't like you. And you keep driving, and they don't even read the rest of it. Right, and then likewise, they do the same to you, you know, you liberal Democrat, right? Nobody actually hits anything because nobody changes their minds, but you're just firing stuff all over the place. That's most online interactions, right? You're just driving around trying to shoot shots at each other, and, uh, and nothing's happening except, you know, bad things. In fact, there's a whole, uh, there's a new, well, uh, there's a, I guess it's called an acronym that's, that's come up, that's recent. Uh, how many of you guys know what TLDR stands for? Yes, jo tell us, Josiah. Yeah, Too long, didn't read. Right, so sometimes people would just be like, hey, can you TLDR this for me? Just give me the summary, right? That's what, uh, a big effect of what social media has, has devolved to. It, it, it prizes reducing complicated topics into just a few short outlines and sentences. It kills our ability to have deep conversations in real life. And especially, again, uh, for our students, uh, because, again, because you grew up when, in this, this has more of an effect on you. Uh, for you guys, especially the danger is some of you guys 
have no social skills, right? As someone who grew up as an awkward, you know, little Asian boy myself, I already understand how hard it is to develop social skills before the age of smartphones. But now, with smartphones, especially for our young people, you actually have to really work hard at developing social skills. For some of you, I know this is a big challenge, but you have to understand that. Like, learn how to talk to people face to face. Learn how to talk to people in real life. Because social media is very bad at careful and meaningful communication. Lastly, social media is bad at building real relationships. Social media is bad at building more uh, real relationships. And this is another one of those big lies of social media. The big promise as uh, things like Facebook started taking off is, well, you can be connected to more people than ever before, right? All those people that, that you lost touch with, your old school friends, you can just find them on Facebook. And man, think about all the relationships you can build. And then we find out that's not true, right? Sure, you may have added that uh, old high school friend as a, as a friend on Facebook, but well, the only time they contact you is to enlist you in their latest you know, multi-level marketing scheme, right? You know, whatever it is they're selling, you, you tend to be like, well, why are you contacting me? In fact, as we've seen play out in our society, in our churches, in our world, the more connected you are on social media, the actually the more disconnected you are from reality and from real people. Right? But we buy into this lie. Just as a reminder of how real relationships ought to be, right, let's take a look at Acts 2, 44, 47. Right, just a description of church life when the church first started, all the way back in Acts chapter 2. Right, and all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved." Right, some of those things, and again, because we've gone through two years of pandemic, it, it's, it, it sounds a little foreign to us now, right? Breaking bread together in our homes. I can remember the first time we invited people over uh, after COVID hit, right? It felt like such a thrilling and taboo thing we were doing. We're like, should we keep our masks on, right? Uh, when we eat, do we, do, we, do we social distance, right? Just that act of having a meal together seems so foreign. But even before the pandemic, I think social media has perhaps lessened or, or dulled our senses to how much we need actual human contact, especially amongst believers. Right, you know, I jokingly mentioned that, you know, hey, it's good, we don't have to attend those, uh, those uh, full board meetings anymore in person, but we must fellowship and worship in person. Right now, I understand that there are, uh, there are those among us who, for, for various reasons, cannot make it, and I'm grateful for the fact that we can live stream. But I also do remember that first Sunday when we were back, when we opened our doors again, you know, the, the tears that I had in my eyes as I heard the congregation singing together. Right, such a simple thing, and uh, perhaps, you know, one of the other good things that came from the pandemic is we realized how important that was how the simple act of getting together, especially as believers, is so important and so God-honoring. So again, this, these are, this is a warning to those about the shortfalls, the failures, the weaknesses of social media. And again, this is, I highlighted these particular points uh, because I feel like they're, they're good ways, again, to gauge how much of an effect it's had on your life, right? Uh, for, for some, maybe you are absorbed in having online duels with people, 
right? Uh, whether it's political or religious, you know, or, or whatever, you use social media as your main means of engaging in conflict and trying to communicate. You have to understand it's not really good for that. And you can do a lot of harm if that's what you rely on. For, those, for, for, for others, maybe you see social media as your only real community, and you need to be reminded that community involves real people and real relationships. Right, so as you think about and look at your own social media use and, and the impact it has on you, uh, be aware of these weaknesses. This leads us to our third principle for social media use, which is this. You must flee the pitfalls of social media. Flee the pitfalls of social media. And really the idea here is to really understand that as you are kind of venturing online, uh, as you're venturing into the realms of social media, you have to view it like a minefield. You have to view it like a minefield. Not only are there strengths, there are weaknesses, there are outright dangers. There are outright things that can damage you, that can destroy your faith, that can destroy relationships. You must be aware of the dangers that are out there. Let me just highlight three particular dangers out there for you. Number one, social media is very good at dulling your discernment. It's very good at dulling your discernment. One of the, the characteristics that ought to mark uh, every Christian's life is the, the characteristic of discernment, being able to understand God's word, being able to use God's word to help us navigate what is right and wrong, what is true and false in life and in the world. And social media has done a great job at destroying many believers' ability to do that, or at least, at the very least, dulling it. It does this in a few ways. Um, number one, uh, uh, social media is very good at exaggerating the extremes. Exaggerating the extremes. Uh, basically, it, it loves to promote what is extreme, whether it is political, whether it is sexual, whether it is the, the, you know, at the cutting edge of what's considered fashion or art. Social media is all about promoting and exaggerating the extremes. On the political side, this has led to a very unrealistic polarization. What I mean by this is research has shown that uh, five to 10% of the most uh, politically left or right, it's the five to 10%, you know, not the majority, five to 10% of the most politically left or right people uh, make up for 70% of all the political posts that go out on social media. Right? So, in other words, it's the most fringe groups that account for uh, the largest percentage of content out there. And, and what this has done is to make people who are more in the middle, who are more moderate, who may not take as extreme stance, feel like they're, they're, the, they're the minority. It, it makes you feel like, well, all these voices are taking sides and fighting and being so loud, I must pick a side. Right? It, it sets up an, an unnecessary choice. Social media is also very good at making extreme behaviors or fringe behaviors or even deviant behaviors seem normal because it gives you a glimpse into people's lives. Anybody can just say, hey, take a look. I'm normal. I'm living my life. You know, I'm making it work, whatever lifestyle they have. And to, to many, this just represents reality. It exaggerates the extremes. Social media is also very good at treasuring what is trivial and what is temporary. At treasuring what is trivial and temporary. It is a common joke amongst those who use internet and use social media, you know, to say that, you know, 90% of internet content are cat videos, right? Because, uh, and, and you know, some of you are, are snickering because you understand, you know, how many times have we just, oh, you know, this is a cute video, and you start looking, right? It, it tends to put up whatever is trivial ahead of us. And even more damaging than that, the nature of social media is to dwell 
and focus you on what is temporary. Right? Social media cannot have any permanence because if it does, it stops making money. Right? If there's no new content, nothing to push the envelope, nothing new, no new challenges on TikTok, people would stop using it. So it keeps pushing forward temporary things. They don't want anything to last. They love fads and new challenges. Ultimately, it's a waste of time. But even worse, it is anti-biblical. Because if you think about it, the whole point of the Christian life, so much of the Christian life, is just simply reminding us fallible, temporary human sinners that there is an eternal God out there. Right? It's reminding us temporary uh, human beings that there are things we can do with our lives that can have eternal consequences, that can have eternal value, that can have eternal reward. Right? The, the biggest reason why we have preaching and teaching is to remind Christians of that. That, hey, this is not all there is. You know, set your eyes and your minds and your hearts on things above. And social media does the opposite. Right? So often it takes our eyes, our attention, and it focuses right on things that do not last that have no eternal value, that don't even have any value the next week. Again, my, my goal is not to make anyone feel bad, okay? And I've seen my share of, of TikTok videos, I've laughed. But you have to ask yourself, man, how much of my time and my resources am I putting into this thing, right? Am I doing anything of eternal value? Will God be pleased or proud when I show him, you know, all my, all my TikTok videos, all my posts, right? Not to say that he can't, but I would venture to say most of what we post has no value. Finally, uh, another way that social media can dull your discernment is the ease at which it can legitimize lies. There is so much, uh, you know, you want to call it fake news, you want to call it misinformation, disinformation that can get right through there, right? Virtual sharing community makes it very easy for anyone to say whatever they want, and if they say it loud enough, and if enough people say it, it becomes the truth. It becomes something you can't ignore, and it dulls your discernment as a believer. Philippians 1, 9 to 10 reminds us this is what Paul prayed for, right? This is what Paul prayed for the church in Philippi, for his brothers and sisters there. He says, It is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. If you go, in, you venture into the realms of social media without any discernment, you turn your brain off, you will be misled. You have to be discerning because it is actively trying to dull your discernment. Number two, social media infects your identity. It infects your identity. As I showed earlier, um, even secular sources, uh, you know, uh, we're pretty much in agreement that social media has had a very negative effect on mental health, right? Especially among the, the, the young. Led to more depression, suicidal thoughts. And to get to the answer of what's behind that, research has shown that a big part and the big danger of social media use amongst adolescents, uh, it is because for, the, for young people, uh, the, the junior high, high school years is when your identity is forming. And if you add to that a lot of social media use, there's a lot of confusion about identity. In fact, one of the main effects of social media use among young people, those who use more than three hours a day, research has proven, has shown that, that they, they, they don't know who they are or what they're supposed to do. They, they are adrift. They don't know who they're supposed to be. But this is a danger for 
all, uh, all ages as well. Right? Because social media, how does it affect your identity? Number one, it subverts your standards. It subverts your standards. It, again, if you go into it without discernment, social media is essentially uh, that, that refrain you find in the book of Judges. Right? Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And that's bad enough in the days of Judges when people just did that. But nowadays, the refrain would be everyone posts, everyone defends, everyone promotes what is right in their own eyes. And it is very hard to maintain your, your biblical standards, your Christian standards, if that's all you're inundated with every day. Your standards begin to change about what's right, what's wrong, what to believe about issues. Another part of that is social media is very good at chipping away at your contentment. Right? Remember FOMO? That became a thing because of this very effect. The more time you spend on social media, the less content you'll be. That's probably a good general saying. Right? Because as you see all the best that people put forward, some of it, much of it may be faked, you start questioning your own life and you start comparing and jealousy and ungratefulness crops up. And finally, social media deforms, infects your identity by deforming your desires. Right? The end result of all of this is you start desiring what is pleasing to the eyes, what is pleasing to the world, and no longer what is pleasing to God. We read the, the theme verse for our series, uh, Informed and Transformed, earlier, Romans 12. Uh, sorry, Romans 12, verse 2. And it's talking about this idea of having your mind renewed, and that's what transforms you. Otherwise, the danger is being conformed to this world. And, man, social media is a very powerful conforming tool. 2 Corinthians 3.18, oops, I guess I put that out of order. 2 Corinthians 3.18 reminds us of what ought to be transforming us of what ought to be shaping our standards, our desires, what ought to be the source of our contentment. All right, Paul writes this, As we all with unveiled faces beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Right, how do you renew your mind? How do you be transformed? You spend time looking upon the Lord. You spend time dwelling on his word, and through that, through the work of the Holy Spirit, using the word of God, you are transformed. You are not conformed to the world. I mentioned before that social media is a window to the world, but for many, social media has become a window, not to the world, but to worldliness. It is a way for us to find out what the world is seeking after and to follow after it ourselves. We must remember the warning in James 4.4, 4, that friendship with the world is enmity with God. And make sure it's not a window to worldliness for you. The last warning, last pitfall, that it dulls your discernment, infects your identity, and finally, social media can sap your spirit. Social media can sap your spirit. In fact, this, this phenomena is so prevalent that uh, you know, even the, the secular world had made a note of it. I think back in the, uh, the mid-2010s, there was a, a phenomena that people started talking about called Facebook fatigue, where it's basically they noted that you know, kind of a relationship between the amount of time you spent on Facebook, that was the main social media platform back then, uh, it leads to the same amount of fatigue and depression and just feeling tired. If you're not careful, it can very easily happen this way. It happens in a few, for a few reasons, right? How does it sap your spirit? Uh, number one, social media is good at feeding your fear. I mentioned before the polarization, the taking sides, the, the loud voices, the 
sensationalism. What gets pushed to the front has to be the most extreme, and it feeds your fear. It arouses your anger, right? Because angry uh, viewers will continue clicking and reading, right? Fearful viewers will continue clicking and reading. But the effect that this can have on your life is that it will hinder your hope. Right? What really saps your spiritual life is when your hope is stolen or destroyed. And social media is very good at that. How many of you guys have ever, for example, spent some time going on YouTube or Facebook and, and at the end of that session, you say, well, I'm more hopeful about the world, right? Can you raise your hand? Because I like to talk to you, like, how did you do that, right? I mean, most of us, you understand, right? The, it's the opposite. It's the same as, you know, spending time just watching the, the news, except amplified, because all of it is targeted towards you and your preferences, right? Kind of scary how some of the stuff you, you, you're like, did I text somebody? You know, how, how am I getting ads about this topic when I don't feel like I've, I've only talked to somebody about it? Are they listening? Right? It's so targeted to your desires, your wants, your needs, your fears, and it's so good at stealing your hope. Right? That's not even talking about issues of bullying and suicide where people are actively out there you know, saying bad things about you. Just approaching you know, social media use at a quote-unquote neutral level generally has this effect. It saps your spirit. And again, it goes back to where do we draw our strength? Where do we draw our identity? Where do we draw our foundation from? And 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18, reminds us, So we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away. Our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. A Christian's contentment, a Christian's hope, a Christian's spiritual strength can only come from daily connection to the Lord, from daily reflection. Right? One of the themes of some of these verses you see is, man, it, it really takes a lot. You must spend your time, devote your thoughts, your, your, your eyes, your heart to the things of God. Or else you're going to be shaped by the world. And with social media on the side of the world, that shaping, conforming happens much faster. And so as we come to our, prepare to get into our conclusion, once again, I highlighted these dangers because they are a gauge for the influence social media has had on your life. Have you seen these, are you aware of these pitfalls, these, these landmines? Have you stepped on some of them yourself? Right, if this defines most of your experience, I would say you probably have a problem with your social media use. It's, it, it's probably an idol. It could be you know, a, a, an outlet for sin in your life. Are you aware? Have you experienced these dangers? So in conclusion, how do you make the most of social media? And this is sort of a, uh, I guess I was trying to make a pun. <laughs> you make the most of social media by making the most of Christ by making the most of Christ. Uh, I, I'm speaking to Christians. If you want to use social media well, you have to make the most of Christ. Uh, he has to be first. He has to be the one guiding and guarding your life and the one you are following. So that means for those of you who, you know, maybe you realize, man, social media is, is an idol. It's taken this place in my life. It's what defines you. It's what gives you joy and meaning, maybe this could be a sign that, that maybe you've never trusted, you haven't fully committed your life to Christ. 
And even if you stop your social media use, you would just be replacing one idol for another. So first of all, you must come to Christ as your Savior. But if you have, let me give you three good uh, kind of concluding thoughts. How do you make the most of social media? Number one, be discerning. Number one, be discerning. That means you must use it wisely. That means your brain can't be turned off when you use it. Right? I'm guilty of this myself. Sometimes I'm just like, man, I'm tired. I, I just want to go and see what's on YouTube, like flipping on a, a TV, you know, TV to watch something. Uh, I have to make sure I'm actively engaged. All right? I can't turn off my mind. Discern. Use it wisely and do the most with it. Make sure you are building on those strengths and using it truly for the glory of God. Right? That's a novel thought. Like, if you think about it, does your social media usage actually glorify God? That's a good way to think about it. So, so discern. That goes for everybody. For some of you, you may also need to detox. Detox. That means you need to use it sparingly. You need to use less of it. The way you can make the most of social media is by making it less. And that's, that's got to be true for, I would say, actually, most of us. Right? I don't think any of us would say, like, I need to be on Facebook more. <laughs> right? uh, we, we need to detox. Use it sparingly. Treat it as a potent and dangerous substance that, uh, though, could be used for good, has a lot of dangers, use it sparingly. And finally, for some of you, maybe it's time to ditch it. Maybe it's time to ditch it. The way you can honor God is by not using social media. And the way you can make the most of social media is by making it the least. It's not for nothing that, that Jesus, uh, in his Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, he said these powerful words. I'm paraphrasing here, right? It's better for you to cut off your right hand. If, you're, if your right hand causes you to sin, it's better to cut it off and throw it away. Right? It's better for you to go into heaven without a hand than to go into hell you know, with the hand. And we understand that Jesus is not advocating self-mutilation because what does he say next? He says, hey, if you look at a woman with lust in your heart, you've already committed adultery, right? So even if you pluck out your eyes, it doesn't work. He's not talking about self-mutilation. He's talking about radical spiritual surgery. He's talking about, man, if you're aware that there is something that is causing you to sin and drawing you away from God, are you willing to cut it out of your life? And for some of you, if you think about it, right, what is the one thing that is uh, bringing down your spiritual life, driving you away from people, away from God? Some of you may answer, it's, it's social media, or it's your phone. And are you willing to cut it off? I don't mean like, oh, well, you know, I can't be using it for anything, but I do mean taking some radical steps. Right? For students, taking the unimaginable step of telling your mom and dad, please help me use my phone less, or please restrict me, or please block me, help me with this, mom or dad. You know, it doesn't have to be mom or dad. Talk to, talk to sponsors, teachers, talk to, you know, somebody godly to help you with this. Right? But for some of you, it may mean, hey, I'm not ready to use a phone. I'm not ready. I shouldn't be using this or that or, you know. I'm getting off this app or that app because it is dishonoring God. It is drawing me away from God. It is killing my spirit. So think about that. Discern, detox, or ditch. Social media is a powerful tool. Make sure it is not a master. It is a terrible master. Let's pray. Father God, we... Lord, we thank you both for the benefits of technology, but also for the dangers that it brings, Lord. It is so much more clear now, Lord, just how much we need your word, of how true your word is. Lord, as we see the chaos going on around us, Lord, it is becoming more and more clear how much we need you, how much we need to be transformed by you. Lord, I pray that... Uh, for every person here, that will be our pursuit. Lord, we want to set our minds and our hearts on things above while we're passing through this temporary, transitory life, Lord. Help us not to be 
uh, enamored by the things of the world, Lord, but that we are transformed by the renewing of our mind. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Pastor Tim, for um, that message and, and for the many great reminders of indeed how important it is that we navigate uh, with discernment the world around us, especially as we receive it, interact with it through social media in its many forms. And as such, let's uh, respond in worship that we would lift up in our hearts uh, and in our lives none other than Jesus above all else, that he would form and transform us from within to apply to our lives as we go on from here. So we'll respond with a couple songs here.
That's right, I'm going up first. 
<laughs> uh, just a few quick announcements. Just a reminder that uh, during October, for the entire month, uh, we will be taking a love offering for Samaritan's Purse, which is the shoebox ministry. And for November, uh, we will be taking a love offering for our missionaries. And... Oh, a quick announcement for the shoebox ministry operation, Christmas Child. Um, now is the time to be gathering the shoeboxes and all the uh, materials. Uh, if you have questions, please contact Lanny uh, Mock, and uh, you can see her information there, and we can get that information out to you. Uh, we're in need of empty shoeboxes. And... Oh, just a quick announcement uh, for, just so everybody's aware, there will be no Thanksgiving dinner this year. There's just, just with lack of locations and concerns still with COVID. Uh, but we are planning to have some sort of an outdoor event next summer. I don't think we're quite at the point of calling it a picnic yet, but maybe. Uh, so we're, trying, we're still trying to do a kind of a big all church event where we can get together, but aiming for next summer. I believe that is it, and uh, Deacon Sheldon actually has a, a quick announcement before we close in prayer. Good morning, everyone. I uh, just wanted to share a couple of updates so we can be aware of them and keep them in prayer. The first update involves Pastor Tim and his career direction, which impacts our current pastor search focus. And the second update regards Pastor Theron's interim status. Uh, so for the first update, looking back, it was been nearly two years ago that Pastor Philip announced his decision to take on the new position at Davis, causing a pastoral search committee to be formed shortly thereafter. For more than 18 months, the committee, with much prayer and diligence, conducted the search for a suitable candidate for the English congregational pastor position. But the Lord, in his sovereignty, did not bring forth such a person. However, God has been working, working in the heart and mind of Pastor Tim, molding and shaping him, granting him a vision and desire to move in the direction of becoming the congregational pastor. In recent discussions with the leadership, Pastor Tim has made known what he felt the Lord calling him to do, and we gladly want to give Pastor Tim the opportunity to move into the position. The leadership understands that there are certain areas to work on, and they are forming plans which will aid Pastor Tim developing into the position of the congregational pastor. Those also include plans for the pastoral search committee to revamp our search process, as we will now seek an associate pastor whose emphasis will be on the youth. Along with this update, 18 months ago, Pastor Theron graciously agreed to be an interim here at CIBC, and he and Shirley have been a real blessing to us in providing stability, much guidance, shepherding and leadership. Theron's contract officially ends in October, but he has graciously extended it another few weeks through November 15th. We are so grateful for their ministries and we lift them up in prayer as they discern God's leading. I'll share a few more details during IBF today, but if you have questions during the week, please think about them and as you please share them with me and let, it, let me know what they are so that we can collect the questions and then we will try to address them during the following IBF on the 30th. Uh, so let's keep Pastor Tim, Christina, Pastor Theron, Shirley, and the search committee in our prayers. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Sheldon. Um, yeah, just to add to that, uh, in case you, you missed it, we'll have a bigger, I know there's a lot of questions, there's a lot of details to go over, um, so there'll be a bigger presentation on this next week. If you have questions in the meantime, we want you guys to think about it and direct them all at Sheldon. <laughs> He's gonna be collating, because I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of similar questions. Um, yeah, so 
uh, we will definitely have a deeper discussion about this, but we want to tell you guys to give you guys time to, to think about it. Um, with that, uh, would you stand and let us close our service together with the benediction and prayer. Father God, would you continue to guide us, grow us, and transform us? The, may, the, may the love of God the Father, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with us. It is in his name we pray. Amen. God bless you. You are dismissed to IBS. <laughs>